All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Christina Diakis. I'm with Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and I'll be your behind the scenes host for today. Um, before I hand the webinar over to our Extension Program Leader, Tori Gabriel, a couple of technical notes. All attendees are in listen only mode. If you're having trouble with the audio at all, the participant drop down in the top left corner should include an audio broadcast option. Click on that and WebEx will help you reconnect to the audio broadcast. We'll be collecting questions from attendees via the chat box in the right hand sidebar. If you don't see that sidebar, you can hover your mouse over the bottom center of the screen and click the speech bubble button that pops up. Before sending any messages, please make sure that the send to option in that little drop down box is set to all panelists. That just helps us collect those questions better. Um, if you have any technical questions, you can use that chat feature as well. I'll do my best to help you out. Uh, if nothing else works, leaving the webinar and reconnecting is usually a good way to fix everything. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the Ohio Sea Grant website uh, pretty soon after the event ends. We'll also be posting some additional resources there. The link is on your screen right now and we'll have it up again at the end. It's the same link you use to register. Um, and without any further ado, I'll hand things over to Tori Gabriel, who will introduce our speakers. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Christina. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is Tori Gabriel, Extension Program Leader and Fisheries Educator for Ohio Sea Grant. Uh, as you know, we unfortunately had to cancel the annual Charter Captains Conference due to the COVID-19 situation, but um, as we contacted folks to to cancel, many of you asked for us to put on some kind of abbreviated version on an online format. So, so here we are. Thank you to those people who, who suggested that. Um, that includes Paul Pachulski for, uh, and, and LACBA for the encouragement to continue on with us and, and help us pick out which of these talks we wanted to provide. Um, thanks to Christina, the Ohio Communications, uh, Ohio Sea Grant Communications team for setting everything up and hosting this. And uh, of course, thanks to the Ohio Division Wildlife Speakers and Administration for supporting this effort uh, and helping us to get it together so quickly. Uh, as most of you know, one of the main presentations every year at the conference is the Charter Captain of the Year Award. So we wanted to make sure that this person was given the proper recognition they deserve. So that is the first item on our schedule today. Uh, your agenda says Scott Hale, Executive Administrator of Fish Management and Research for the Division of Wildlife. Scott is on with us today and has really supported this program, uh, but we were also able to be joined by the Chief of the Ohio Division of Wildlife, Kendra Wecker. So we will have a slight agenda change as Chief Wecker will be presenting the Ohio Charter Captain of the Year Award. Chief Wecker, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you, Tori. I appreciate you having me here today and thank you for all participants for calling in and being here with us online. It's definitely a different change and unprecedented time and we appreciate your patience um, in dealing with all these issues and we're eagerly looking forward to being back out outdoors fishing and uh, in the field with all of you. But in light of that challenge, uh, we do want to take time to recognize the captain of the year. And this individual has been an advocate for Lake Erie and the Lake Erie Charter Boat Association during his career and has done many, many activities, um, including conducting Sea Grant water sampling collections, two trips to provide fish for our walleye tagging program, five tours during the harmful algal, algal bloom season for TV news crews, and also West Basin tours for scientific groups. And he also participated in the Governor's Fish Ohio Day the 40th anniversary last year, and has, he's done that for many years. And he also set up a farm group tour during harmful algal blooms uh, time in the Western Basin. So with that, we want to announce that Captain Don McGee is the Charter Boat Captain of the Year. So congratulations, Don, on behalf of the Division of Wildlife and um, all the other entities that are out there that are supporting the Lake Erie Charter Boat Association. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Chief Wecker. Uh, congratulations, Don, for that very well-deserved honor. Um, 
sorry we couldn't do that in person this year, uh, but this I'm, I'm assuming so this link will be available to to public. So this will actually be disseminated a lot wider than than even our normal audience. So that's pretty cool. So again, congratulations, Don, uh, for that very well deserved honor. Um, next up on the agenda, we have another presentation that is a typical highlight of the Charter Captains Conference every year. Eric Weimer, the supervisor of the Sandusky Fisheries Research Unit for the Ohio Division of Wildlife, is here to present the status of Lake Erie Fisheries and the 2020 Fishing Outlook. Uh, just a reminder, if you have any questions as Eric is presenting, please enter them in the chat box to all panelists, and then we will compile those and address as many of those as we can at the end of the talk. Uh, Eric. Thanks, Tori. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me just fine. Um, really uh, excited for the opportunity to uh, present this. Uh, this is one of the highlights uh, of my spring each year. A lot of work that my staff uh, puts into making this presentation happen. Uh, and uh, I hated to see it go to waste, so I'm grateful uh, to have a chance to share it with, with all of you. So as is typical, um, I'm going to, to begin with, with an overview of uh, the fisheries from 2019 for walleye, yellow perch, and smallmouth bass, um, to talk about harvest trends, recruitment, population estimates, um, perhaps some diet work and, and also highlight some research projects that we're either currently working on or uh, beginning to kick off. Of course, the Lake Erie Fisheries Unit, we, we kind of have a split personality. Uh, half of what we do or, or a large portion of what we do falls under assessment surveys. These are the activities that we undertake to um, feed the population models. Uh, that includes the harvest estimates uh, from uh, the Creel survey and from uh, the commercial monitoring. Also the, uh, the estimates of recruitment that we get from the trawl survey each year and the other tools that we use to estimate uh, walleye and yellow perch and other species populations in the lake. Uh, so that's a, a large component of what we do uh, the other part of what we do is the, the research element. Uh, that research can take on a lot of different flavors, uh, but some of the, the more interesting work that we've done, been doing lately has uh, revolved around uh, fish movement uh, and habitat use, uh, using acoustic telemetry. There's been some uh, hypoxia work that uh, has uh, been, we've been working on and are continuing to work on, and then always looking to, to refine our uh, population metrics and the approaches that we use to estimate fish abundance. So right, right off the bat, uh, this, this figure shows the number of uh, licensed charter guides that we've had in the fishery since 1975. Uh, there were 810 licensed guides in Ohio in two, uh, 2019. Uh, it's the first time since 2004 we've been over 800. Uh, so that it's definitely responding to uh, the number of guides are, are increasing with, with the quality of our, our fishery. And the, the, the biggest reason why uh, those number of, of guides are expanding is because of our, our current walleye fishery. This figure shows targeted walleye effort, which is the green line, and walleye harvest, which is the, the red uh, shape, uh, over time. Uh, and over the last 20 years, we've been around about a million fish per year fishery, meaning that on average, we, we harvest around a million walleye each year. Uh, 2019 showed a large increase in harvest, over two and a half million uh, walleye. Uh, and this came with only a small increase in effort. 2019 effort was just over 3 million targeted uh, hours uh, fishing for walleye. Um, we broke the 2 million fish harvested mark for the first time since 2007, and we did it with almost half the effort. 
our fishery is becoming increasingly efficient, as you can tell. Harvest rates are reported in the number of fish per hour of effort and is displayed for both charter and the private anglers. In 2019, harvest rates were the highest on record for both the charter and the uh, private anglers. And of course, as I say every year, uh, charter industry can take some amount of pride in that they're uh, always their harvest rate is always above that of the uh, private angler from our estimates. But in, in this year, the, uh, the harvest rate uh, for the charter industry was over one fish per hour, which is just an astronomical number. Uh, it may not seem like much, but when you look at regional fisheries, this is, uh, I think, Calling it outstanding doesn't quite do, the, do it the justice that it deserves. This is a phenomenal rate of, of harvest, that fishery. So if we look at monthly harvest rates, we see that there's a lake-wide peak in the month of June, uh, especially in 2019. Um, this year, that high harvest rate continued in the central basin but the lower western basin, western basin harvest rates brought the overall average down when the fishery slowed down in, in late summer and early fall. But even, even compared to an average year, which is the green line, our harvest rates, even, even when it was, the fishery was slower, were still well above average. So there was more good news. The, that came from the trawl survey this year. The 2019 walleye hatch was the second highest in the time series, uh, and it only followed the 2018 uh, hatch. That, uh, that makes two record hatches in consecutive years. Uh, and to put this into some kind of context, the 2018 hatch uh, was, uh, there were 256 a uh, young a year walleye per hectare uh, from our trawl survey. And this is this is all the West Basin. This is Ontario and Ohio waters. So 256 is, is the record. Last year in 2019, there were 225 uh, young a year walleye per hectare. And the 2003 year class uh, is way back there in third place with 183 per hectare. So those of you who have been involved in this fishery for a while can place the last two hatches in some context uh, in comparison to 2003, and you'll see there's uh, some really uh, bright days ahead uh, for our walleye fishery. So one of the nice benefits to having this conference delayed a month is that I can uh, include the most recent uh, Lake Erie Committee walleye task group model runs, uh, the model run estimates um, in this presentation. So the model is predicting a lake-wide population of 116 million walleye that are age two or older for 2020. Um, so that includes the fish from the 2018 year class and anything older than that. Uh, those 2018 fish will likely uh, grow into our fishery uh, into a legal length uh, sometime mid to late summer or early fall and uh, will provide a big bump in uh, the number of fish available for harvest. So basically we are expecting outstanding walleye fishing for 2020 season. We have an extremely large population of two-year-olds and older. Uh, there are record hatches uh, that have been in the last two years. Uh, our harvest, we anticipate at least uh, initially, will be dominated by a fish from the 2015 year class, which are age fives, uh, those 20-inch, lower 20-inch fish. There's still fish out there from older year classes that will be providing a trophy fishery. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, the 2018 fish will be abundant and uh, will 
will be um, hitting that 15 inch minimum size uh, likely by the end of summer. Um, and you're also going to run into an awful lot of uh, yearling fish this year that are going to be undersized, uh, which is going to carry our fishery for an awful long time. So now I want to talk about uh, yellow perch. So this figure shows yellow perch effort, which is the green line, and yellow perch harvest, lake-wide harvest uh, in Ohio waters in, in, in the red. Uh, 2019 effort and harvest were the lowest in the time series and are continuing a downward trend uh, that began almost 10 years ago. Part of the decline in, in effort and, and in harvest uh, it was at least in part due to the outstanding walleye fishery taking effort away from perch fishing, but we know that, that perch fishing uh, itself wasn't that great this year, which I'll illustrate in just a moment. So uh, the 2019 harvest rate was the second lowest in the time series at 1.6 yellow perch uh, harvested per hour of effort. Um, however, I, I think that it's important to point out, uh, rather than being all doom and gloom, that we have had low rates like this before in the past, uh, particularly if you look on the, the figure back to 1990, um, and the fishery has recovered. And so we anticipate that given time, the fishery will recover uh, like it has in the past. Yellow perch hatches continue to be um, the story in, in what's driving these population abundances uh, in Lake Erie. Uh, so before I, I talk anymore, note that the Western Basin figure on the left uh, has a different vertical Axis a different scale than the central basin figure on on the right. Those no, those those figures aren't directly comparable to each other, but it gives you an idea of of within each basin uh, how uh, the yellow perch hatches have been faring uh, for the past 20 years. Uh, in the west basin, uh, 2019 continued the seven-year trend of good to excellent hatches for yellow perch. Uh, however. Uh, the two management units in the central basin have had below average, average hatches during the same time period. M most of what's being caught uh, in the central basin uh, are fish that are, are from the 2014 year class. Uh, we've had only two hatches in the central basin that have been anywhere near what we would consider average, and that would be the 2014 and the 2018 hatches. Um, the 2019 hatch in the central basin was uh, was not very uh, strong. So these are the estimates of the uh, yellow perch uh, in each management unit uh, based on the most recent yellow perch uh, task group uh, model runs. So these are the abundances of adult yellow perch or those that are two years old and older. Um, and you'll notice that essentially the estimate for 2020 uh, places all three management units in a similar uh, abundance. Um, and despite being a much smaller management unit, uh, the West Basin population is similar in size to the two in the Central Basin, which uh, are a much larger area. So there's certainly a higher concentration of two-year-old and older yellow perch in the West Basin than there are in, there is in the Central. So thinking back to our low harvest rates, so low abundance is, is really what, what drives a lot of this, this uh, fisheries struggle uh, in the Central Basin especially. But many of you know that the West Basin uh, harvest rate was, was fairly low last year as well. 
lower abundance isn't the only factor that's affecting our, our poor yellow perch catches. Uh, this figure shows what a uh, typical historical look at yellow perch forage is during the course of a season. Uh, the green line are invertebrates, things like zooplankton uh, and uh, midge larvae, mayfly larvae, and the blue line are fish item, prey items that we find in yellow perch uh, diets. And you can see that even though they kind of bounce back and forth during the course of an average year, there's typically a almost 50-50 or 60-40 a balance between the amount of fish prey and the amount of invertebrate prey in a yellow perch's diet. This is what we're seeing in current yellow perch diets. There's been a tremendous reliance upon uh, invertebrates uh, in, in their diets. Uh, and this has taken the form of um, a lot of uh, chironomid uh, midges and um, I mentioned zooplankton, particularly the uh, bithotrephes or spiny water flea. There are still some uh, fish forage that are in yellow perch diets, uh, but it's mostly been round gobies and not the typical fish prey like emerald shiners or rainbow smelt that we would normally see. So this is a picture of what a diet full of uh, bithotrephes or spiny water fleas looks like from the yellow perch. Uh, and that, that why those, those piles there are just uh, dozens upon dozens or hundreds upon hundreds of spiny water fleas. And that's what we're finding during, during most of the year is a tremendous reliance upon those as forage. Um, this, I guess suggests that perch are likely uh, behaving differently due to the forage that they're eating and that it probably, and I can't tell you what to do or how to do it, but it probably makes sense for folks to try different things uh, rather than uh, putting a shiner on a spreader on the bottom like we always have. Um, we believe that bethotrephes are, are more available higher in the water column, so yellow perch might be suspending more than typical, um, but there's definitely other things going on than just the low abundance that's uh, keeping our, our yellow perch fishery from having those typical high harvest rates that we're used to. So what should you expect uh, in 2020? Well, uh, frankly, I think things are going to be similar to they were last year. We have a fishable population of yellow perch in the West Basin due to those seven straight years of, of decent hatches. Um, the Central Basin is likely to still be a struggle because of the lack of hatches there. Uh, we have a variety of age, different ages in the yellow perch population in the West. Um, and not in the east, in the central basin. Those, those fish are basically coming from the 2014 year class. Uh, and uh, and our, our best advice uh, to those who are going to try and target yellow perch is to try your best to match the hatch. Uh, it might require trying some different uh, water column, you know, depths in the water column. It might require moving around a little bit more might require some different baits um, than what we typically use. But uh, as far as the upcoming year, um, that's a, the best advice that I can give you. We do have a uh, yellow perch related research project that's going to be kicking off in the central basin. I, I think I mentioned this last year, we had collected some uh, preliminary data looking at distribution of yellow perch uh, around areas uh, that have hypoxic zones set up. Um, this was a collaborative work or is collaborative work with the U.S. Geological Survey here in Sandusky with Ohio State University, uh, with NOAA, the University of Windsor, Windsor, and with uh, the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Um, we are actually um, proceeding with this project 
by bringing on a graduate student at Ohio State who's going to be uh, looking at data in hand and also uh, conducting some additional work to look at yellow perch movement and dis distribution and also the influence that hypoxia has on those, on those fish. So we're, we're just going to be kicking off this, this work um, It was supposed to be kicking off this spring. We'll see uh, what all happens as far as this summer goes, um, but uh, watch for that. We're really hopeful that this is going to get us some better insight into our uh, yellow perch fishery, especially in the central basin. And lastly, I wanted to talk about our Lake Erie black bass fishery. So this figure shows a smallmouth bass effort in green and harvest in red uh, since 1985. Um, there was a slight uptick in both effort and harvest in 2019. Um, a lot of people will immediately remember that we changed the smallmouth smallmouth bass regulation last spring to allow um, harvest of one fish over 18 inches um, during the uh, May and uh, through the up to the fourth Saturday in June. And you might think, well, you know, allowing some spring harvest is, is why the, uh, we see an uptick in, in effort and in harvest. And actually, uh, very few fish uh, were harvested during the spring season, even though it was legal. The vast majority of the increase in harvest was uh, during August and September, when a lot of the charter effort was redirected from yellow perch fishing to uh, targeting smallmouth bass. But still, in, in the grand scheme of things, the less than 5,000 smallmouth that we estimate were harvested in 2019 is, is as you can tell, it's just a drop in the bucket compared to the past. In uh, 2019, effort for largemouth bass in the main lake exceeded effort for smallmouth bass. Uh, this happened in 2013 and 2014 um, and has been close for, for many years since then. Uh, and this reflects an increasing largemouth bass fishery on Lake Erie. And part of the reason for that increase is due to uh, the difference in catch rates uh, between largemouth bass and smallmouth bass. Um, the, uh, the largemouth bass catch rate in 2019 was a little over one fish per hour, whereas the smallmouth bass catch rate uh, was around uh, three quarters of a fish per hour. So what do we expect from this fishery? Um, the surveys that we do for smallmouth bass have been dominated by three and four year old fish. Uh, there are still plenty of uh, older fish that are out there. Uh, we, we also note that largemouth bass are becoming a really solid alternative for uh, smallmouth bass. Um, great catch rates uh, plus their availability you're not having to travel nearly as far, far to access largemouth in Lake Erie as opposed to smallmouth bass. Uh, largemouth surveys are showing a lot of young fish, two to three year old fish with some older fish. And I just want to put in a, a final plug to have people remember that the uh, reg change from last year, uh, that there is a, a fish that over 18 is uh, legal for harvest. Uh, from May 1st through the to the uh, uh, fourth Saturday in June. And speaking of, of smallmouth bass, I, I mentioned this um, smallmouth bass tournament or dispersal project that we we looked at um, in 2018. Uh, we we tagged 23 smallmouth bass from a, a fall tournament. Um, and in Sandusky Bay and, and release those fish with uh, uh, the, the acoustic tags. We had uh, monitored them both in the bay and as they returned to the main lake, uh, the fish were caught from all over uh, the West Basin and, and 
potentially even from Lorraine. Um, and we, we watched those fish disperse. Um, for the most part, it took approximately three weeks for those fish to begin returning to Lake Erie. Um, and approximately 40% of them remained in the bay after two months when, when we pulled our receivers out of the bay, which was interesting. And this is all stuff that I told you last year. But you know, we have that large grid that's out in Lake Erie uh, year round. And so when we downloaded that grid data uh, last summer, uh, we got to see where some of these smallmouth bass that were, that were caught in the main lake and released in Sandusky Bay, we got to see where they went and how they moved. Uh, in total, out in the main lake, we detected eight of those bass. Uh, they moved uh, as far as Peely Island, the Bass Islands, and the Rain, and uh, they made movements of up to 57 miles in one year, which is really uh, astonishing. Uh, and something that's very unique to the literature to see bass um, making movements like that. Uh, we are in the process of, of getting additional funding to continue this research, uh, but it's really exciting for us uh, as a, to see some unique information coming from one of our, our side projects like this. Here are the contact numbers for the, the Sandusky and the Fairport Harbor uh, offices, uh, as well as other ways to get a hold of us if you have questions. Uh, and uh, thanks for allowing me the time. That's awesome information. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I've been monitoring the chat box, and I have not seen questions. Um, from captains come in, but I do have a couple of questions that that I have routinely heard um, from captains. So I'm going to pose those. And folks, if you if you do have any questions, please do enter those in the chat box, and then I can I can get those read to Eric. Um, but one, Eric, what is uh, what is the effect of so many walleye on the yellow perch population? You've had these two record hackett, ha hatches back to back. Um, does that have any effect on the yellow perch population? So we, we do know just from our diet work that, that um, walleye do occasionally uh, feed on yellow perch. I mean, that's, that's not a surprise. Um, when there are high numbers of predators and the, the typical preferred prey fish like you know, gizzard shad and emerald shiners and rainbow smelt, are low, when those, those numbers get driven down by predation um, or by uh, lack of hatches, as is, as is the case with emerald shiners for, for quite a few years now. Um, we know that walleye will feed on whatever's available, and uh, that includes white perch and white bass. It, it includes gobies and includes a lot of things, but it does include yellow perch. Um, I don't. I don't think that we are, we can say for anything uh, for certain that walleye have been the, a factor in keeping the yellow perch populations low. That's driven entirely by hatches. Um, you know, having a, a high abundance of walleye may make it more difficult on a, you know, at least in a single year for yellow perch to recover, but at this point, it's all hatch driven, and uh, that's what we need. We need some good quality hatches in the central basin. Great, thanks, Eric. Um, how about with the with the switch to largely spiny water fleas and the yellow perch diet? Has that had any effect on the yellow perch physical condition? or growth rate? No, we haven't seen any uh, change in, in their condition. Uh, so we don't believe that that's, that's having an effect at all. But we just, we really think that that's um, partially, that's a response to increasing numbers of spiny water fleas, decreasing numbers of uh, preferred forage, and, uh, and that, that, that is what it is right now. 
Okay, so here's uh, an answered question. Um, <laughs> how, how good are you at math, Eric? Uh, and a quick, quick turnaround. So here's a math problem for you. So somebody wants to really, they just want to understand the, the catch rate calculation. Um, so for instance, right. um, if two people fish six hours and catch 12 walleye using two rods, what is the catch rate? Yeah, it, it's per person. It's it's not per rod. So, um, you know, it would be it, it just it, how many people are on the boat. This is all part of the um, the the creel survey. So when when you're interviewed, how many people were fishing? What were you targeting? How many did you catch? How many did you harvest? So it, it, the the number wouldn't be uh, anything to do with the number of rods so i mean you're, you're just doing simple math at this point um, for your catch rate but you will you apply that throughout the entire fishery uh, during the course of an entire season and that's where that uh, that larger catch rate comes from great yeah, and this is this is travis i'll, I'll jump in there it, it's uh, you know real simple math if you have two people in your boat and you fish four hours, that's eight hours of effort. So your your harvest would be divided by that eight hours of effort. Great. Thank you, Travis. So yeah, Mitch, in your in your example with two people for six hours and twelve walleye, that would have been um one fish per hour then. Um, if I'm doing math right, that's not a guarantee. Uh, the next question is, what is the effect of the commercial perch fishing on the harvest rate? And has their total allowable catch been reduced? Well, you know what, I'm going to pass the buck on this one because Travis's presentation gets into how the, the management decisions are made and looks at uh, the tax, yes, you know, just in general, um, commercial perch fishing for, you know, for our trap net industry has been struggling as well. Uh, and um, their tack has been reduced because it's, it's uh, associated with the uh, um, estimate of the population in each management unit. But I'm going to let Travis get into that after his presentation. Yeah, and I, um, thank you, Eric. I I'll at least touch on it right now. We'll talk more about how we determine those things during my presentation. But uh, a couple high points are that um, as the central basin population declines, the total allowable catch also declines. And we're at a point right now where our trap net fishery in Ohio has their lowest industry quota since 2001. And that's primarily based on the decline in our central basin total allowable catch or our quota. And I, I've talked to a lot of anglers separately about this. I would, uh, I would argue in the central basin right now, you know, if, if trap netting was removed tomorrow, we would not see a change in angling harvest rate. We've had too many scenarios where anglers are where the perch are and, and they're really just tough to catch. There was a scenario a few years ago where trap nets were really catching fish in September off of Cleveland and the trap netter gave anglers the coordinates and head boats went out and caught like eight fish for a, a 20 angler trip. It's just, it's frustrating right now. But even when perch are being found, they're just difficult to catch. And I truly believe that removing the trap net fishery wouldn't change angler harvest rates. There are different mechanisms at play, but we'll talk about it more in a minute. Great, thanks, Travis. And then that touched on. We had another question uh, specifically: Is the commercial fishing in the central basin affecting the perch fishing? But I think you just answered that pretty well. And um, look forward to your talk here in a couple minutes. Uh, another one came in while we were discussing that: uh, How many creel surveys were made last year? Uh, because this person was was never interviewed last year. Yeah, let's see. I'm trying to remember. I just saw not too long ago the number of interviews that were uh, conducted by our creel clerks, um, and I can't remember what that was. I want. Oh, I hate to even. 
venture a guess. Uh, I don't want to be wrong. So we have, uh, there are six uh, creel clerks that work along the shoreline of Lake Erie. They are each assigned to a section of the shoreline. So for example, our area one creel clerk works from the Michigan-Ohio border uh, over to the uh, davis bessie area, in the Western Basin. Um, they are assigned uh, different locations throughout the day. It's an eight hour day and they are basically spend um, a set amount of time at each location in their area conducting interviews and doing boat counts. Um, it does happen that, that people don't get interviewed, um, but during the course of a year when you're, you're piling up thousands upon thousands of, of interviews, uh, it, it does kind of shake out. One of, the, one of the things that we had a struggle with last year, the, our Creel survey is designed specifically to um, interview anglers as they're returning from their fishing trip. Uh, what we found last year is that we were starting uh, our creel surveys late enough, you know, mid to late morning, that there were already uh, successful anglers returning back to the dock before our creel was started. And we had to adjust that mid-season so that we could collect more return data. So. Um, if you're not interviewed uh, during the course of a year, uh, don't stress about it. Um, there's certainly no, no prize for doing it other than our uh, undying gratitude for helping us manage this fishery. Okay, uh, a follow-up to that, just a, just a comment. Um, that he had run 60 days out of Minky's Marina the year before um, and was interviewed numerous times. So I guess the question there is, um, was there a difference in, uh, in hours of, of creel clerks this year? No, no, especially Mankey's, there, there wasn't any difference. It's just the fishing I think was better. Tori, I'll, this is Travis, I'll, I'll throw in, you know, over the years we've done this, we. We see a difference every year with, uh, you know, clerk behaviors, clerk tendencies. Obviously, when uh, it's great when we get clerks back year to year to year, but uh, lots of them move on like we hope they will. And when we get new ones, uh, the new clerks might have new tendencies. Maybe they gravitate towards a certain area of a marina during their set aside interview time. And, uh, you know, we, we really hope they're moving around the marina, quote unquote, randomly interviewing every boat that they can. But, uh, you know, maybe they find an area of activity that's not an area a certain person's docked in. And, and that year they often go back to the other area of activity. So uh, clerk, clerk tendencies do impact who does and doesn't get interviewed. But what's really important is that they're getting interviews from people that are fishing the same areas that that person might have been fishing. So. We're counting on uh, the fact that lots of people fish the same areas, and as long as we get a, a good uh, distribution of interviews from people fishing that area, it's it's not as critical that we get information from every single person. I'd, I'd love to do a census. It'd be great to have, like, the deer tag program for walleye, right? But uh, we have to do the best that we can and cover a large area. Great. That makes sense. Thank you. Thanks, Travis. Um, the questions have stopped coming in here. I had one quick one personally. So on your smallmouth bass slide, uh, Eric, why was there only, I think it said you tagged 23 in Sandusky Bay, um, but then there were only detections in the main lake for eight of them. Did the others just not leave Sandusky Bay or was that mortality related or do you, do you know the answer to that one? So 40% of the fish that, um, from that, that first fall, 40% of them did stay in the bay. Um, I, I don't know long long run whether they left or not because we, we pulled those, those bay receivers out. Those were only in there temporarily for short-term post-tournament uh, um, movement uh, study. Um, the, the, the biggest thing is that um, while there may have been some mortality in, in the, the fish that kind of disappeared on us, um, we, we 
acknowledge that the grid that's out in Lake Erie is not, it's not designed to cover every square inch of, of the lake, and especially if fish hug the shoreline uh, of, it, of the main, you know, the main shoreline, um, they can they can avoid being detected on some of those uh, those receivers. Uh, so it, it's entirely possible that those fish were out there and just avoided detection. Um, putting receivers in shallow water is uh, it's a recipe for losing receivers, and those things are very expensive, and, and we're hesitant to do that. So great. Thank you. Yeah. Any of the, the any of those studies and the data you guys show of the those tagged fish is always fascinating. So thank you very much for presenting that. And and we do. We I, you know I wanted to mention that we are continuing to work. You know thankfully with with members of the Charter Boat Association to continue to tag walleye for our mixed fishery work. Uh, I didn't have any update that was really available this year that it would have been any different than what you've been presented before. But as that project continues, we should have some neat uh, information to share as well. Awesome. Looking forward to it. Okay. Uh, so those are the questions we've got right now. If you guys think of any more, um, Eric's going to be sticking around. So we can we can go ahead and type those in the chat box. I'll try to keep track of those and we can ask those at the end if we have time. Uh, but at this point, we're going to move on to Travis. So Travis Hartman is the Lake Erie Program Administrator for the ODNR Division of Wildlife. Uh, Travis's presentation is on setting the limits, how we manage the Lake Erie fisheries. Again, as you have questions for Travis, please enter them in the chat box, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Travis? Thank you, Tori. And uh, I'd like to especially thank everyone that chose to log on today and, and also those that watch or listen to this after it's recorded at a later time. It's really unfortunate we weren't able to get together this year. As Eric mentioned, both of us look forward to this every year. And uh, I, I guess from my perspective, we'll enjoy it even more next year when we're able to get together. So this presentation that I'm going to give uh, had, you know, pieces of, of information from this were in Eric's, but I don't believe I've ever given this presentation to this group, and I, I think it's a good place to do it. I'm going to talk about the management process. I'll touch on the, the higher lake-wide process and then how that fits into our uh, quota and, and limit setting process. So I'll jump right in here. If any of you have seen any of my recent presentations, or actually probably for about the last decade, you've seen this slide. Uh, I like to make sure and point out that we're part of a larger process through the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and the Lake Erie Committee. Uh, all management jurisdictions around the lake take part in this process. And if any of us uh, managed in a vacuum for our own needs and purposes, it, it just wouldn't work in a system like Erie, and especially for highly migratory species like walleye. So when we talk about uh, the perkids, walleye and, and yellow perch in the, at the Lake Erie Committee level, this is the general process that we follow. Up, up in the top left-hand corner here, you can see that each of the jurisdictions do their own surveys. We all survey our own sport fisheries and charter fisheries. We uh, assess our commercial fisheries, and then we also do assessment surveys that are outside of the fisheries, things like our gillnet survey in Ohio that we do in the fall. And this is an annual process where, you know, we have long, long-term data sets that all, all jurisdictions collect this information every year. And then for walleye and yellow perch both, there's a, a walleye task group and a yellow perch task group. And all these data sets feed into the task group model. That model is run on an annual scale. It's constantly evaluated and, and when necessary, improved. But ultimately, each year we run a task group model that provides a population estimate. It's a, Actually, it estimates past years and it predicts the current year. So for this year, in 2020, back in March, the models were run and we got a predicted walleye population. The, the model itself predicts three-year-olds and older. And then our trawl projections from two years ago project this year's two-year-old incoming year class. So we have a trawl projection of two-year-olds and a model 
prediction of uh, three-year-olds and older. So for uh, each species, we get a population estimate. That's uh, handed to the Lake Erie Committee. I'm Ohio's Lake Erie Committee rep, and each jurisdiction has a representative. And we use the, the population information along with a lot of other factors, and at the end of the day, we set a total allowable catch or attack. And that's considered this year's safe level of harvest that each agency manages to stay within. So each jurisdiction gets their portion of the tax, and that'll be described a little more in the next few slides. And then uh, the agencies set their own commercial quotas and angling daily limits with the intent of uh, staying within that tax. So we'll jump right into walleye. We'll uh, do the walleye scenario first because it's by far the easiest. All of you know how much walleye move and how lake-wide their uh, annual trek is. So walleye are managed on a lake-wide scale. We don't break down uh, areas of the lake. So this is just a quick representation of, of what I showed, but specific to walleye. Our walleye task group runs a walleye population model each year, which is a lake-wide estimate. And then they, they calculate what we call a recommended allowable harvest. That safe level of harvest, or RAH, is then handed off to the Lake Erie Committee. And based on uh, the information and, and the RAH, we set a total allowable catch. For walleye specifically, that's broken up between Ontario, Ohio, and Michigan. Uh, Pennsylvania and New York do take part in the process. Their data are included, but they're considered outside of the traditional TAC area, so that the TAC setting process is built on Ohio, Ontario, and Michigan and our annual harvest. And um, Pennsylvania and, and New York absolutely manage in a similar fashion. It's just not directly part of the TAC. But then once that TAC is completed, all the jurisdictions set their uh, daily limits and their industry quotas. Moving to the next slide. I'm sure most of you are aware that we have a walleye daily limit table in Ohio. This is in Ohio Administrative Code. And this started back in 2010, and, and really we had found ourselves trying to predict years ahead because of the rule change process. It, it, we can't quickly change a, a daily limit. So what we decided to do was take a historical view, use past information, and build a table that based on our Ohio quota or our Ohio TAC, directly sets the bag limit so we're not having to respond and change the, the law to change the, the daily limit once the quota comes out. So if you look up in the top left-hand corner this year, our Ohio TAC is 5.2 million walleye. And for those of you that have followed it, you realize that we recently added to our walleye daily limit table, and now we have a, a top tier that's 3 million fish and above. So when our Ohio TAC is over 3 million fish, and it obviously is this year. From May 1st through February, that sets the daily limit at six. And then uh, next March and April, just like this year, it'll stay at six, except for the Sandusky River and Sandusky Bay that are currently separated out at, and capped at four for the daily limit. So you can see we're, uh, based on this year's TAC, we're set at a six, six daily limit through next April for uh, for the main lake and, and all the tributaries except for Sandusky. If you look at the history of the recent history of the TAC, on this slide, the black line is the lake-wide TAC, that, that total uh, lake-wide safe level of harvest. And you can see where the 2003 year class came in. We were just barely under 10 million in 2006. So this recent increase, uh, now that we're over 10 million fish, puts us back in that same ballpark we were in when the 2003 year class came through. But you'll notice how different the trajectory is of that of that TAC. And that's thanks to the walleye management plan. We now have new lake-wide management procedures in place that set a 20% annual change constraint on the TAC. So we, we can't go up more than 20% over the previous year. And that actually significantly constrained the TAC this year. If, if we had, had not had that TAC constraint in place, this year's TAC would have actually ended up around 16 million fish. 
And the idea is to spread this good fishing out. We want to provide a lot of opportunities and, and do it for a lot of years to come. And then if you look at the Ohio portion, that, that blue portion, you can see we're again in that range that we were in after the 2003 year class. And uh, we expect to be up there for a while now with the hatches that Eric mentioned in the previous presentation. If you look at our Ohio TAC uh, in relationship to those thresholds I just mentioned, now these thresholds haven't been in place over this whole time series. If you look at the six daily limit threshold for May through February, that uh, took effect in 2010, so that's been active since then. And of course, this new six daily limit threshold for March and April was just implemented early last year, so it, it's new. But uh, you can see our, our blue Ohio line uh, climbing well above the March, April six daily limit threshold, and uh, we'll, we'll see it there for a while. So when you think about our uh, our daily limit table, again, you know, when, when we have more than 3 million fish in Ohio, we're ensuring the, the year-long six daily limit for uh, everything but Sandusky right now. And, you, and keep in mind that this TAC compliance is, is the main goal here. We want to provide opportunity, but we also want to stay within our total allowable catch. And it is an annual maximum. It, it's not considered a goal that we are trying to reach. And you take even further into account the fact that walleye live a long time. You know, we've learned a lot the last 15 to 20 years about walleye age and growth, and, and we switched to the ear bones or otoliths that we now use to age fish. And we know that when fish aren't harvested, they live well over 15 years even at times, and we see fish into the 20-year-old 20, 20 range. So as long-lived as they are, strong year classes support many years of angling opportunity. And we're just coming out of this with the 2003 year class, as uh, we saw one functionally one year class support the fishery for as many as 10 years. So we really want to do our best to conserve this incredible fishing we have. And that conservative harvest really supports a diverse age structure and the best oper op fishing opportunities for all sizes of fish. So as much as we all like catching a, a quick limit, it's nice to have some uh, big fish in the mix too. So. The longer we can uh, conserve these year classes, the best age structure and, and ultimately fishing opportunities we have. And one of the things Eric pointed out, and especially from, from my point of view where I sit, I'm really keeping an eye on these uh, quickly in increasing harvest rates. And it's phenomenal and it's really exciting to, to publicize what's going on on Lake Erie. But to put this into a little different perspective than uh, Eric's presentation did, this is uh, the entire time series for our creel survey for the harvest rate. And when I first got here in 03 and Eric shortly after in, in 05, I believe, you know, we really looked back at the 80s as a time period that, that honestly, we, we probably couldn't even hope to reproduce. You know, we had, it was a golden era of fishing. We had a lot of participation. We had good population that had just recovered after the the contaminant issues from the 50s and 60s, and we really looked at the 80s as, as kind of the goal or something we really hope to get back to at some point. Fast forward to now, and, and we're approaching a time period where we're, we're increasing towards double the 80s harvest rate, and that, that still just blows me away. If you'll get those annual harvest rates from the 80s, as great as fishing was, they were in the 0.5 range. We were harvesting 0.5 walleye per hour of angling effort. And of course, we had a lot of effort. That's how we harvested more fish. The, the huge effort combined with good catch rates really drove the harvest. Now you'll get at a time that we're, our effort is lower, but our, our, our harvest rate is increasing at an astronomical pace. And those asterisks that I've placed on the 80s are actually individual years. Every year that has an asterisk is a year that we went over our Ohio Tack. We harvested more walleye than the total allowable catch uh, would have liked us to. And I point that out because that was during a, a six daily limit time, time period. We had the same six daily limit in the 80s that we have right now. Obviously, I, I don't expect to get back to those 80s participation or, or effort levels. That, that's probably unrealistic. But I absolutely expect to see an increase in boat trips 
I expect to see some level of increase in in effort as the publicity gets uh, you know spread region wide how great Lake Erie is and I just would like to point out that we're very comfortable with this six daily limit and uh, we think it's the right place to be and when you look at the tra trajectory of harvest rates with the uh, potential for increasing effort and and we think six is a, a conservative level that it will keep us at the tack while still allow, allowing plenty of opportunities so thought I'd like to share that just to show where we stand in relationship to the 80s because it it still blows me away that right now our success rate is so much higher than the 80s and and you know you all realize what that's due to you know we have better technology we have better knowledge um, we we follow the fish more than we used to follow with the year-round fishery there there are a lot of things that really play into this uh, harvest rate and uh, Really looking forward to seeing where it ends up. I'm, I'm curious if we can push that one per hour rate for an entire season. So pretty uh, spectacular time. It's worth uh, it's worth focusing on how good things are right now for sure. I've used this slide in quite a few presentations. Uh, you know, a lot of people have access to, to multiple frequencies on their sonars now. Sonar technology has gone to an incredible place and. When I'm running around on the lake, I like to uh, have multiple frequencies up. So in case when I'm running, maybe one frequency shows something, another frequency doesn't. But with this current walleye population and the numbers of fish we're looking at, there are days and, and places where all three frequencies tell you the same thing. You're over top a lot of fish, and usually when you see something like this, as soon as they choose to bite, it's, uh, it's hard to keep up with the action. So really exciting time for walleye, no doubt. So with that, I'll uh, transition into perch, probably a little more to uh, talk about, especially with uh, the complexity of yellow perch management. So I'll jump right into it. Um, most of you probably realize that yellow perch don't move as far as walleye. Uh, they don't migrate and utilize the entire lake. Uh, we, we see movements that are more on the order of 25 miles when we tag perch. When they get recaptured, it's used, the average distance from tagging to recapture is usually around 25 miles. So uh, we do what we feel is most appropriate with yellow perch, and that's managed by, by basin or by management unit. So for us in Ohio, management unit one is the west basin from Toledo to Huron. And then we have two central basin units where management unit two is from Huron to Fairport and our waters of management unit three are from Fairport to Conneaut. So keep this in mind throughout this rest of this presentation that we are managing by these management units. Similar diagram to uh, walleye here, but, then it, but as I just mentioned, keep this management unit level uh, in the back of your mind. So the L Perch Task Group actually runs four models every year. Um, the three management units that we have jurisdiction in and also that Eastern Unit Management Unit 4 that we're not in, but the task group runs four models. They present the LEC with four recommended allowable harvest ranges. And then the Lake Erie Committee sets total allowable catches in each jurisdiction or in each management unit, and then each jurisdiction gets their portion of that management unit's uh, total allowable catch. And Similar to walleye, that ends up in both industry quotas and angler daily limits once the individual jurisdictions uh, receive their, their quotas in each management unit. So in Ohio, this is a, a basic diagram of, of how we work with that. Uh, based on our regulation and allocation changes back in 2007, uh, and a, a task force process that created a task force report that guides our allocations. We consider our ent entire Ohio allocation, so management one, two, and three Ohio share combined. Our anglers receive 65% of that total, and then 35% goes to our commercial trap net industry. Once we have those two values, the two fishery amounts, it's then distributed amongst the three management units where we feel we have the, the best room to offer each each quota, but adding up to that 65 and 35% total for Ohio's total. And one way to visualize that within a management unit, and I'll pick a simple, simple management unit like management unit two, 
So those are our west waters of the central basin, that area from here on to Fairport. If you think of that blue circle as the management unit two perch abundance, and then that smaller yellow circle within it would be the that MU's recommended allowable harvest, the, the maximum safe harvest for that year. The square within the circle then is the, the TAC that's set by the Lake Erie Committee. That's the MU2 TAC. And then the two green uh, rectangles within that box would be Ohio share and Ontario share. So the two jurisdiction TACs uh, within the MU TAC. And you can imagine those blue ovals as the fishery harvest that comes out of that TAC. So you can see each fishery has, you know, a piece of the population that they're removing, and it fits in with the jurisdictions TAC, which fits in the MU TAC. So in Ohio for this year, when you look at Ohio's TAC, and see I, at the top of the slide, I have each management unit in our 2020 Ohio TAC. We're slightly over a million pounds, and, and with yellow purchases in pounds, not fish, but we're at a, just over a million uh, pounds in Ohio MU1, just over a million pounds in Ohio MU2, and then in, in MU3, we're just under a million pounds. And if you think back to Eric's slide showing the population trajectories and how all the populations have ended up in a similar range, kind of explains how we end up with a similar tack in all three MUs which is really an unusual scenario. We're not usually here where all three MUs are at a similar, similar level. If you compare that to our daily limit table, so just like for walleye, we have a yellow perch daily limit table on Ohio Administrative Code. You can see in the Western Basin, we need 800,000 pounds for an angler daily limit of 30, and we've achieved that this year. In MU2, we need a 700,000 pound allocation for a 30 daily limit. And in MU3, we need a 500,000 pound allocation for a 30 limit. And we've achieved those levels in each of the three MUs. So we'll still be at the 30 daily limit for anglers this year, this upcoming season. And then when you look at the sport and commercial shares, uh, with everything combined in Ohio, the sport share ends up just over 2 million pounds at 65% of our Ohio total. And the commercial share ends up at just over a million pounds which is 35% of the Ohio total. And as I, I think I did mention a little earlier, that 35%, that 1 million pounds, that is the, the lowest trap net uh, quota that Ohio has allocated since 2001. And it's, it's reflective of the central basin decline. If you look at each management unit, how that plays out, those are the three individual bars on the, on the graph. Uh, we're looking at sport levels in the west of 690, 690,000. Uh, commercial at 371 and management unit two from here on to Fairport, we're at 750,000 for sport and 385 for commercial. And then in manage, management unit three in the eastern waters of Ohio, we're at 636 for sport and 342 for commercial. That's a straight 6535 within each management unit. And this is the, the same slide that Eric used, but and I think we probably can't focus on it too much. This is a perch that was caught in a, a Western Basin survey. I believe it was in August or September last year, or September if I recall correctly. And that that's the mass of uh, spiny water fleas that came out of it. And you know, as frustrating it is, as it is, Eric gave some good pointers. I, I would just say that you've got to, especially with this group and, and your knowledge of using sonars and and seasonal movement. You've got to use everything you know to find perch. And once you find them, you've got to stay on them. And I, I think it's really comparable to the walleye bite during the peak of the, the mayfly season. A lot of times it seems like the walleye bite during the mayfly season is much shorter windows during the day. The walleye are very full and, and feeding at will on mayfly larvae that are emerging. So there's they're shorter uh, feeding windows and you really have to be there when they're feeding. And I. I think that's really similar to yellow perch. You have yellow perch now that are full of these invertebrates nearly all day. And it it seems like it's shorter time windows that they're feeding in. And uh, there was a question earlier about uh, condition the perch. You know, the one thing we have seen is the youngest perch, the one-year-olds and two-year-olds are growing as fast as we've ever seen. 
and that that's outside of condition that's length at age but you know eric mentioned the percher in in good condition we haven't seen a condition change this is actually uh, a period of excess for perch. There's an excess food source available and, and they're growing as fast as we've ever seen at younger ages. So uh, when we talk about the impacts of this diet change, it, it really is a, an angling impact. It, this isn't something that's harming the perch or uh, slowing the growth at all, actually it's increasing the growth. I, I do see, I'm glancing over here at the uh, chat and I see what what's caused the increase of the spiny water fleas and it. It's interesting because we've had spiny water fleas in the central basin. This isn't new in the central basin. I think you have two somewhat different stories in the west and the central. In the central, you have water fleas that have been there, and they are utilizing them at a higher percent, probably because there are fewer emerald shiners and fewer smelt right now. But the thing in the central basin that's really changed is the proportion of midges that we're seeing. And we don't have an estimate of midge density, of larvae density in the sediment. That's not something we sample. But just based on uh, perch diets, you know, we know for a fact that in the central basin, they're eating much more midge larvae than we've ever seen. So we have to assume there's a higher density available to them. And it's kind of a perfect storm of, of midge larvae available, especially early in the day. And then the water fleas is in the central basin sit on the thermocline during the day. and it, sets up a scenario where perch can feed at will and uh, really aren't forced to search for food much from what we can tell. In the West, the water fleas are a, a new expansion. And just uh, looking at some of the baseline data we have, the decline in catch rates in the Western Basin absolutely match up with the trajectory of increase in water fleas, the bifitrephes in the Western Basin. So. I think it is two kind of different stories. In the West, you have a new food source and uh, water fleas, which hadn't been there, and, and perch are fully utilizing them. And in the central basin, that food source had been there, but now you have an increase in a different source, which is uh, midge larvae. So, uh, talk plenty about that. Uh, with that, um, Tori, I really wasn't watching the uh, the comments prior to that, that's the uh, end of the presentation that I have, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Travis. Um, that was the only question that has come in so far based on your presentation. Um, at the end of the last presentation, it was a minute or so before people uh, send any in. So please, if you do have an additional question, Send it in. There we go. Um, Don asks, how much has hypoxia changed the harvest survey? Uh, thanks. That's a good question. And so the, our our harvest survey, our, our creel survey, hasn't changed at all due to the hypoxia. But actually, we have asked a few new questions relative to hypoxia. So we historically, we didn't ask how deep of water the angler was fishing or how deep in the water column they were fishing. And a lot of times, uh, you know, some of our, our grids have consistent depth, so you could infer depth fishing just based on location. But we have now started asking what depth of water were you fishing and how deep in the water column were you fishing? So from last year going forward, we're gonna have a whole new data set looking at what depth the water anglers are fishing in, how deep they're choosing the fish in that water column. And I think it's gonna give us some interesting information with perch because if we can better determine how to, to catch these perch, if, if there is a time or a place where you can catch them higher in the water column, we will have that documented in the, the Creole survey, at least the angler's best estimate of it. And I, I would argue in the central basin, um, the, uh, the movement of that hypoxia is probably the biggest deal because we're seeing perch have a tendency to hang out on that hypoxic edge where the hypoxia hits the bottom. And, and when that hypoxia moves in and out and it's so dynamic as it was this past season, that really impacts where the perch are and how easy they are to find. So uh, I, I think that's a big deal when it comes to actually catching the perch. I see there's a question there about the size of the water flea. Um, I, I think the best look at that is, oops, I, I flew right by it. 
is is the slide where, as Eric mentioned, these are literally just like balls of spiny water fleas. And when you look at it, if you're looking at these um, clumps of water fleas, you'd see all their tiny little eye dots. They they are a plankton species, but they are visible to the naked eye. So they're very small, but they're visible. And actually, when you get uh, if you troll it all and get them building up on your line, you can kind of look at them at your line in the sun and see the eye dots and, and see that spiny tail. So big enough to see, but very small. And Tori, I also see there's a question about accurate location of the hypoxia. There's, as you might imagine, there's actually a lot of work going on right now at both measuring and modeling the, the location of movement of this hypoxic water. And this past year, it actually made it pretty close to Kelly's Island. This wasn't simply a, a central basin uh, concern. NOAA is doing a, a hypoxia model, and I believe that is more widely publicly available now. I think in its initial years, uh, four or five years ago, Tori, and maybe you or Seagrant can speak more to this, but it might have been a, a private site in the past. But I think anyone can log on to that now if you search NOAA hypoxia model. And once we get into the summer and a hypoxic season, they have uh, up, it's a, a daily animation that you can click on that shows the movement of the hypoxia and how it, it grows and shrinks and, and moves north to south and east to west. Uh, Tori, I, I don't know how much you followed it, but uh, that's widely available now, right? Yes, um, and so I will try to look that up. Obviously, I don't think that's available right now. That's not active at this time of year, um, but I think I can find that website and uh, I will I will try to link it on this webpage where all these recordings um, will be available. I believe last year I was able to sign up for a an email as well, so I would get a weekly email update on the hypoxia forecast. So I'll try to include that in our meeting notes here at the link. <laughs> that is a great resource because you know while you still have to go out there and, and use your sonar and and kind of determine where it is, or even better yet, if you happen to have a temperature probe of any kind, like the fish hawk stuff that you can run off your own boat, uh, that that modeling prediction of where it is, is is a great starting point, at least gives you a ballpark idea of if you're fishing the central basin, where should you expect that to be? Right. Um, so all this talk about hypoxia, uh, there's a question about, can you explain what the hypoxia is? Yeah, sure. So it's it, and probably dead zone is the most uh, publicized term, uh, but basically what, what you have with Lake Erie, and it has a lot to do with the, the bathymetry and shape of Lake Erie. There was actually this phenomenon well before people were here. And, and what happens is, when you get warming water in the summer, you end up getting a, a thermocline. It's a very uh, narrow area of, of quick temperature change. So you end up with warm water sitting on top of cool water, and they start functioning as two separate water masses. And you can actually see it on your sonar. If you turn the gain up high enough and, and run over it in the summer, you'll get a really hard line in the central basin a lot of times about 50 feet down. And what you have is very cold, uh, what water mass that's below that thermocline, and as the summer progresses, biological material is decaying and using up oxygen, and it hits a point where there's very low oxygen in that entire water mass below the thermocline. And that's where on your sonar you can really see what's going on. There are times in early July in the central basin where you'll see the thermocline, there's no doubt it's there, and you see lots of fish below it. That's when it still has oxygen. That's when fish like walleye are uh, seeking out that cool water that's oxygenated. But as the summer moves on, all that oxygen is used up. That water mass is cut off from the rest of the water column, and it's functionally low oxygen water for the rest of the year until it breaks up in September or October. So the hypoxia just refers to lack of oxygen, and it's a, that cold water mass that's below the thermocline and the oxygen's functionally used up. So all fish that uh, are able to avoid it. And 
That's why we occasionally get a fish kill in the near shore area after a, a hard northeast blow. The wind moves that water mass around and, and when we have a hard north or northeast wind, it can push it up on the shoreline and literally trap fish in water that's anoxic that they can't breathe in. So if you see a midsummer fish kill after a hard blow, movement of that anoxic water caused that. Thanks, Travis. Um, but here, let's skip. So a couple more questions that we'll jump back to. Um, but uh, Don has a follow up to that. Does heat or sunlight hurt or help hypoxia? So the hotter it gets, and I, I guess you can include sunlight in that, but the more that water warms at, at a high rate of speed, the quicker that, that thermocline is formed and the quicker that water gets shut off from the rest of the water column. So in that regard, a hotter summer, more heat causes a, a stronger, larger area of hypoxia. Uh, and it, I would say the heat itself doesn't do much. This maybe sunlight penetrating could increase that uh, decay that I was talking about. So when you have um, decay of, of dead or broken down materials, I, I guess sunlight penetrating into the hypoxia could increase that decay potentially, but uh, the, the heat's role with the hypoxia is setting up that thermocline, setting up those separate masses of water, and the quicker it gets hot and the longer it's hot, the, the stronger that separation is. And then to jump back, um... They asked again about this, the, the length, the dimensions of the spiny water flea. So specifically, John, um, I would say, so really the body of that spiny water flea is not a whole lot bigger than a pinhead, but the, it's probably somewhere between a quarter inch, half inch of a tail that, that sticks out from it there. It, it's, so. typically less, it's typically less than half an inch for the entire body length. But like you said, that's mostly made up of that tail. So, right. Thank you. And then, um, are the lamprey still an issue in Lake Erie? Yeah, absolutely. So, fortunately, we have the Great Lake Fishery Commission that was originally formed with uh, issues like sea lamprey in mind. And the, the Fish Commission operates a sea lamprey control program. Uh, along with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the, the local regulatory authorities. So we absolutely are in a better place with sea lamprey because of the Fish Commission and their control program. That being said, there are still sea lamprey, and it is still a, a hurdle to rehabilitating species like uh, lake trout that are primarily cold water, east basin fish. The sea lamprey really uh, prey on those deep cold water fish that uh, are over there in the East Basin. So anytime you catch a walleye that has a, a big round mark on it, that's potentially a, a lamprey wound that it encountered while it was farther east during the summer. But for the most part, uh, the Western Basin doesn't see as many sea lamprey. We see more of the native, the smaller lamprey, like the silver lamprey. But uh, sea lamprey are still a problem. The Fish Commission is doing a great job of keeping their numbers down. And uh, hopefully we can continue to control those fish through barriers and treatments and and uh, not have them have the impact they used to have on Lake Erie prior to the Fish Commission. Great. Thank you, Travis. And I think that pretty much does it, which is good timing wise, because we've got about five minutes left. Um, so. Thank you, Travis, for all that information, and Eric for chiming in there as well um, with some of those some of those answers. And thanks for all those great questions. Um, so uh, as we wrap up here, uh, I wanted to provide you with a few resources. Let me see if I can get these pulled up. Uh, so again, these this recording itself and the the presentation slides. And the rest of these links that are that you're seeing on your screen right now are going to be available at that first uh, that first link number one go.osu.edu slash OCCC 2020 that is the same 
link that you use to register for this. Um, so that is the only link you'll need to get all of this information that you heard today, including the recording. Um, the number two there is a link to the U.S. Small Business Administration, their coronavirus funding programs. So um, Paul Pachalski and the LACBA had sent out information that much you probably received from them, from the, the U.S. Small Business Administration, um, about their various options that some of you may be available uh, to apply for. So there's that link handy for you um, as a follow-up to that. Larry Fletcher, the, the president of the Lake Erie Shores and Islands and his team have compiled a, a great bunch of federal, state, and local resources and what they call their partner portal on their website. Um, so you can visit that link as well. And there, there's a lot of, of information there, uh, but very well coordinated. So thanks, Larry. Um, one of the things that I have seen for a variety of sectors that are having issues right now is to contact your local chamber of commerce. So if you aren't uh, familiar with yours, um, there is this link number four that will take you to a list of all of Ohio's chambers of commerce. So you can scan through that and find yours and, and find their contact information there. And then if you're looking for information, science-based information specifically about this COVID-19 pandemic, um, science-backed news, information from the university and things like that, Ohio State University has come up with this knowledge exchange uh, COVID-19 hub. So we will link that as well. And then the last thing is a video. So um, back to fishing and on a positive note here, the American Fishery Society launched a video series called Fishery Strong that specifically highlights effective fisheries management throughout the country. And one of those videos focused on the Lake Erie walleye management because of the effectiveness and, and uniqueness of that resource. Uh, that group of partners that were involved in that video includes everybody that's on this webinar. So the LACBA, the ODNR Division of Wildlife and Ohio Sea Grant. Uh, but you can see the entire list of partners. There were many more than that um, in the in the well, I said in the slide, uh, but you can see it at that link when you click there. It's just under five minutes. It's very informational. Uh, some of you that may have social media pages for your business uh, might be good to to link to that there and get that video out. We are going to play it for you today, but videos don't play well on this WebEx platform. So um, there's the link and you can view it as you wish. And that wraps up our program for the day. So um, one last thanks to, to Chief Wecker, to Eric Weimer, and to Travis Hartman for agreeing to speak today and throwing those together so so last minute and, and doing such a fantastic job at fielding all those questions. Um, it's amazing. Uh, thanks for all you do and all your partnerships over the years. Um, thanks to everybody for joining. Uh, and thanks to Christina, for sure, for making this whole thing go on without a hitch. Um, so with that, everybody, please stay safe and well, and have a great weekend. Thank you very Thanks. much for hosting, Corey. Thanks, Chris. Yep, thanks, everybody.